Do you feel like a fraud despite success and external validation? Or like you're always behind the eight ball and never on top of things like you think you should be? Well then stick around because in this episode of the MHT, we're talking all about imposter syndrome, what it is, and how to beat it. So let's go. In this episode of the MHT, I'm invited on to guest host a lecture on imposter syndrome by professor, health scientist, and program evaluation consultant, who also happens to be my brother, Jonathan Aragon. So let's go. Welcome everybody to this webinar on helping your students with imposter syndrome. Uh, I'm Jonathan Aragon, pleasure to meet you. And here with me today is Shamani Diaz, the Director of Preparing Future Faculty. And uh, also uh, I have the pleasure of joining with me today, um, Patrick Martin, he's a psychotherapist and uh, for the LA County and for private practice and CEO of the Mental Health Toolbox. And uh, Patrick, would you like to say hello? Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good day. Good week so far. I was just getting started. Um, like my brother just said, I am a psychotherapist. I have about 10 years experience as a clinical social worker with LA County Mental Health. I have a part-time private practice, and uh, I have my uh, passion projects, uh, blog, YouTube, uh, podcast with the mental health toolbox. So I was asked on today to see if I could um, add any value. I hope I can with uh, this topic in particular, which I think is an excellent topic when we're talking about students who are um, establishing their expectations for their careers and moving forward. So I'm happy to be here today. Thank you so much for allowing me to share what I can. Um, I just want to chime in and uh, welcome Patrick uh, and Jonathan for and, and thank them for co-hosting this. I think this is a very important topic. Um, graduate school is a interesting space. Uh, we're forming our identities. We are forming how we want to move forward. And imposter syndrome lives large among us. So um, thank you all for coming to this um, webinar. I hope you, I have to, unfortunately, I have to run because I am teaching in a few minutes. So I will be leaving, uh, but I'm sure you'll have a great session. Um, and remember always questions, you know, during and after the session, if you want to follow up with all of this, um, do let Jonathan know and, and we can work with you, bring on more topics that um, maybe come out of this big one. Right. There are many subtopics in here that we mm -hmm. might be interested to explore. So enjoy the session, learn a lot, and I'll see you all at another webinar. And thank you again, Patrick, for being the co-host with Jonathan today. Oh, and my thanks. pleasure. It's an honor to meet you, Ms. Diaz. I'll see everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Shaman. I also noticed uh, Tamar is with us. Tamar has uh, taught some courses for us in the past, and she will be offering a webinar this semester. Great. All right, so uh, I did share a link. Oh, yep, Tamar says hi, folks, in the chat. Thanks, hey, Tamar. Tamar. <laughs> uh, Tamar also does a lot of uh, uh, research and journalistic stuff on the Free Britney movement. So be sure to check that out. Um, so I shared in the chat uh, the slides for today in case anybody would like them. And I also put in Patrick's link tree. Uh, if you're interested, uh, he has a lot of great stuff online. So uh, please check that out. Okay. So the essential question for today is how can early intervention for perceived fraudulence transform higher education and lead to greater collective success and well-being? 
the agenda for today is going to shake down as follows. Uh, we're going to talk about what imposter syndrome is and help with that uh, foundational understanding. And then we're going to discuss why it's important to address it in higher education, uh, actual tactics, things that we can do to address it in higher education and in other, uh, in other settings. And the bigger picture are the opportunity, uh, which will be um, how is this unfolding, you know, in our society as a whole. And if we're being future focused about higher education, um, how is addressing this also very important? All right. And just to um, uh, just to prime our thinking about the topic, if you could uh, just go ahead and share one or two words in the chat or out loud when you think of imposter syndrome what comes to mind just one or two words of what pops to mind unqualified they'll find me out second guessing inadequate not feeling worthy, knowledgeable, or capable. Asking for help. Self-doubt and underestimating. Not enough. Yeah. Performance anxiety. Missing information not deserving of success. New project. Mm. That's an interesting one. Maybe anxiety about new project. Mm -hmm. Unreal expectations for individual performance. Nice. Thank you for all, thank you all for being willing to share that. Um, I think a lot of what's been said here is very reminiscent of the um, rumination, the thought process that goes on, and the fears related to imposter syndrome. And um, we'll definitely see some of this. In fact, um, here's a quote that might represent some of those uh, words those things that popped to mind that you shared. The exaggerated esteem in which my life work is held makes me feel very ill at ease. I feel compelled to think of myself as an involuntary swindler. Anybody seen this quote before? Have any idea who, who this, who might've said this? This was said by Albert Einstein, Nobel laureate, as someone who is widely acknowledged to be one of the greatest physicists of all time. Yet from this quote, it seems like Albert Einstein did struggle with imposter syndrome. We've seen similar, we've heard similar things said by notable people of power and influence, such as Michelle Obama, Dr. Margaret Chan, Naya, A-list actors, famous comedians and musicians, champion athletes, well-known CEOs, and best-selling authors. I like this quote from Seth Godin. Yes, you're an imposter, and so am I. And so is everybody else. Superman still lives on Krypton, and the rest of us are just doing our best.
So uh, why did I share those quotes with you? Um, first of all, because I want to highlight the fact that there are plenty of examples of very successful people that have struggled with imposter syndrome. So I just wanna start off by removing any stigma that imposter syndrome would preclude anybody from being successful in life. Likewise, I also feel it's important to highlight that having imposter syndrome is not a prerequisite to being successful in life either. It's merely something that some people struggle with. And like any barriers in life, uh, success and good health are simultaneously achieved when we understand those barriers, we acknowledge them, and we address them head on. Um, imposter syndrome is also not limited to people who are highly successful. Anyone can view themselves as an imposter if they fail to internalize their success. In fact, it's estimated that 70% of people will have at least one episode of imposter syndrome in their lives. Uh, usually when we're faced with a new environment or a challenging situation, such as a new position at work. And um, anyone can actually be an imposter when they display a facade or present public self that is different from their perceived self in order to meet social expectations. So just to uh, focus, the focus of this webinar though is not you know, the, um, the situations in which we might feel like false imposters sometimes in certain circumstances or um, these, uh, the discrepancy between our private self and our public self, but more or less um, imposter syndrome as it's most commonly known to where it's a per se pervasive uh, struggle in somebody's life that leads to a lot of psychological distress. And um, yeah. So uh, just to um, frame our understanding a little bit more, here are some other facts that might help. Uh, false imposters have a subjective experience of fraudulence regardless of the views of objective observers. So when there's evidence of, to the contrary of being an imposter, they still feel like one. That's different from a real imposter. A real imposter takes on a false identity in order to deceive others to the, and the degree of that misrepresentation would be unacceptable, detected. So there's a clear difference between false imposters and real ones. And I would also like to note that imposter syndrome is not a display of false modesty. So humility is something that's considered to be a positive attribute in people, but uh, the, kind of, um, the kind of difficulty accepting the praise of others that we see in people with imposter syndrome is a very different thing. It's also not a pathological disease you know, nor, nor is it a, um, a uh, personality disorder. And it's not something that people are diagnosed with typically. Um, rather, it interferes with the psychological well-being of a person. Okay. Now that we got those things out of the way, uh, when it comes to understanding what imposter syndrome is, uh, here is the imposter cycle posed by Clance, 1985. And um, this shows the, um, that somebody that struggles with imposter syndrome, it usually begins when they're presented with an achievement related task, such as a homework assignment and or work task. And then they have fears of inadequacy or fears of being discovered as a fraud self-protective behavior that triggers this anxiety and worry, resulting in either over-preparation or procrastination, and then a feeling of relief when the task is achieved, 
and then um, discounting the positive feedback, attributing it to either that uh, over preparation, the hard work involved, or luck if you procrast if one procrastinates for a long time and then um, happens to pull through. And then um, that contributes to the feeling of fraudulence. And then it continues again when the, the another task is uh, presented to them. And so Patrick, I'm going to open this up to you to talk a little bit more about it. Sure, can everyone hear me okay? Good, all okay. right. So I don't know about you guys, I'm very visual. So I love it, I love it when there's these like infographs, kind of like Instagram now and you always see like the, <laughs> the depictions of, of what's going on in charts. And um, I think this is done very well. Um, and this being identified, you know, 1985, I think they did a really good job in terms of kind of showing the process because as a therapist, you know, this really speaks to what maladaptive thought process looks like in general. And so, and with the research too, if you dive into this, um, what Clance and, and those after her identified is that there is a strong correlation or comorbidity of anxiety and depression that go along with this imposter syndrome or fraudulence, whatever you want to call it. It's this pervasive idea that um, no matter what happens, there's always the risk of being found out or that somehow we get lucky or there's some automatic negative thought that prevents us from breaking this cycle. And so what I love here is if you look at the achievement related tasks, that box on the top left, you know, this is kind of what we think of as an activating event, right? So this is kind of the begin, the end of what we accomplished, but it's also the, the, the beginning or the resting phase between the next task. And I think when, um, this presentation was started, one of you chimed in with um, new goal, new task as kind of when you think about imposter syndrome. And yes, absolutely, because that is the beginning of the next um, spiral, right? The cognitive spiral that you'll see with someone who has that level of self-doubt, those intrusive thoughts that put us into a tailspin. And you'll see it's labeled here, even anxiety, self-doubt, and worry. We think about anxiety, we think about things like catastrophizing, making mountains out of molehills, um, self-deprecation, um, and that starts the cycle here and the behavior. So we have the activating event, which would be the achievement. Okay, we're coming down from that. Now we're presented with a new task. That starts the process of the compensatory behavior. Oftentimes what we call it in clinical terms, you know, the compensatory behavior is that behavior we engage in to relieve the anxiety, right? So in this case, it's <laughs> one of two things, right? It's either over preparation or procrastination, right? But even with the procrastination, what you'll see even in the research is that that is piggybacked by cramming, right? Or hustling, right? To feel prepared, even though you procrastinated. So the procrastination would be like the avoidance of the discomfort with what is set before you, the new task, the new expectation. And um, that could also be over preparation. I think if you look at this diagram, you'll see that even the over preparation could be the cramming following the procrastination. Um, but in either case, there's a feeling of relief once you feel prepared or once you accomplish that thing, right? And that the reason for that is not just because you accomplished the thing, but it's the, the feedback you get from the environment. It's that validation that says, oh, you did a good job, you know, but nobody else knows what you know, in the sense that every, all of the angst you went through to get that done or to prepare or to cram or all the grief you put yourself through in order to make that come to fruition, all they see is the outcome. And because all you see is the outcomes, they just, you just get that pat on the back, that attaboy, good job, that validation that now you, it solidifies this notion that in order to get the same kind of positive feedback, I have to repeat that same process. I have to 
put myself through that same turmoil in order to get the same outcome. It just reinforces that whole process, right? And so the perceived fraudulence is increased, right? Because it's like, oh, well, if they only knew what I went through to get that done, if they only knew that it was a struggle for me, they wouldn't think so highly of me. They wouldn't think so highly of the outcome, right? And so when it comes to the notion of like impression management, then it almost creates a bigger wedge between us and transparency. Because if we're now, we can't be open about what a big of a struggle that was necessarily, because then people might assume that maybe we, because this didn't come easy to us somehow, we would be a fraud. Does that make sense? So I think whoever put this together, Clance, you know, um, 10 years ago, they were spot on with this, this process. And I think in terms of implications, it's really important that we understand what the point of intervention is. If looking at this diagram, just kind of thinking about this from a sequential point of view, where do you think a point of intervention would be? If you had to disrupt this process, what do you think would be the easiest place to kind of get a foothold? Discount positive feedback. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a great place. So as with anything, there's usually multiple points of intervention. And that's a great one um, because what we do see, and then this is just in like in therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. I mean, there, you know, it's all pretty much the same, whether you look at it from a CBT point of view or a solution focused or just life skills in general. But in CBT, we coin it as negative filtering, right? So we're, the, the propensity is to minimize the positive and blow up the small things. Meaning like if, you're, if your boss comes over or your teacher comes over and they give you some critical feedback on an assignment that you turned in, in your head, you might be thinking, oh, they think I'm this horrible student or I'm this horrible employee or they just hired me and then now I've let them down. And it's easy to get into that frame of mind. But if somebody pays you a compliment and praises your work, right? It's easy to mitigate it, to minimize, to discount that credit. And then this is more than, um, this is more than being modest. It's actually... The, the, the belief, the belief that no matter what anybody says, I'm not good enough. They just don't know me well enough, right? The problem with this, other than your self-esteem and the extra work you're putting out to feel like you have to over-prepare, the problem is the nonverbal boundaries you're setting with people. You know, the person who discounts positive feedback is in effect communicating to other people what your boundary is, that they can see you're physically uncomfortable with compliments. And when people sense that from you, what happens is they will start to respect that boundary, meaning they'll stop complimenting you as much. They will stop even engaging you if they see that you're uncomfortable or even socially anxious. But in particular, for the person who is being praised for their work. If they're, if they, if you, if you shut down, then they're going to stop. They're going to stop praising you. And consequently, sub subsequently, what happens is then there's this even a bigger imbalance between the positive feedback and what you're blowing up in your head as, as negative or critical feedback. And it's because the, the negative feedback can't stop because that's part of the corrective experience in life, right? From, from those in authority, those appraising our work, that never ends. That can't be minimized. But when we minimize the positive, it creates a, a, greater, um, a greater chasm between the two, which further polarizes that view in our own head about our own sense of adequacy, competency. So absolutely, that would be a great place to kind of work on accepting positive feedback and asking follow-up questions. It would be like, oh, what did you like about my work? 
what really stood out to you? What do, where do you think I did a good job on this? What do you think I can improve upon? And then even taking positive feedback and seeking out areas to improve upon and exercising that muscle of soliciting feedback from people will, will counteract and contradict the impulse to avoid. So that's a, yeah, that's a fantastic point of intervention. Anywhere else in this diagram that might stand out to you as a, a place where you could get a foothold, change the dynamic. Um, we had some people oh, say yes. that uh, achievement related mm -hmm. tasks and also as soon as the problem is perceived. And uh, also Tamara has a question. Yeah, go, go for it. Um, Tamara says, how do we communicate with internal monologue telling us not that seeking feedback is being too needy or opportunistic. Absolutely. Um, I love that monologue. I always say internal dialogue, right? Or mental gymnastics, but I like monologue. I'm going to steal that. So yeah, the internal monologue, right? Of wondering like, how will I be perceived if I seek feedback from my environment, right? And Here's the thing, people with imposter syndrome, whatever you wanna call it, or propensity toward that state of mind, they're, they're already tend to be the, the type of personality that wants to please. They want, because they're seeking that validation. So it would be easy for the person who has this level of insecurity, self-doubt, um, fear, to to feel that if they seek feedback then they're somehow going to be perceived as overreaching but let me tell you the the trick here is to understand that when you think you're yelling you're whispering and that's true for everyone when we think we are the squeaky wheel we're really barely being heard you know in the classroom outside the classroom in the world and in the sense that when we're trying to get feedback when we're trying to sharpen our saw, the most important thing to do is to ask questions. Um, I can't remember who said it, but a uh, famous quote says, a level of our success in life can be, be, be determined by the type of questions we ask, right? And by that, by that, I mean, by seeking honest feedback about our performance, which can be tricky because it's easy to make other people our mirror. And that is not what we want to do with anxiety, meaning that we put all of our stock into somebody else's opinion. But it's important to get comfortable with the discomfort of asking questions. And oftentimes that breaks the ice and the avoidance pattern that we would normally have. And just, just feeling like we need to blend in and do enough and not be seen and get the job done. So we can be seen as efficient, right? Because if we ask too many questions, there's the fear that somehow they will know that we don't know, we don't have all the answers and we shouldn't be there, right? Hence we're a fraud. So to answer your question, you know, how do we get past that monologue? We don't give ourselves time to question it. When you catch yourself getting in your own way, you have to take a leap because we can talk ourselves about out of just about anything, including asking for help. And so the, the trick is to act and not get pulled into that monologue before we get in our own way and just get comfortable with being the first one to ask a question or challenging yourself to be the first one in class to, to ask questions. I try and practice this with my daughter, you know, I was in middle school and she's been timid since she was little you know I tell her you know be the first one to raise your hand in class even if it's a question you already know the answer to not because you need to know the answer but because you want to build the habit of speaking up it's really about the habit of just getting comfortable with engagement and not how you're perceived by your peers that's where we get stuck is when we get too, too caught up in what we think other people are thinking about us. That's called the spotlight effect. Um, when you feel like 
everybody's focused on you or you know other people are thinking about you and it's judgmental um in psychology it's called reflected appraisals in the general terms of spotlight effect so we're trying to understand that everybody feels that way to an extent and to get get past ourselves and just get comfortable with engagement and not caught up so much in what we think other people are thinking about us i don't know if that helps Uh, Tamar said, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're and, welcome. And Linda asked if these are often students who ask too many questions or make too many comments. There's a difference between asking questions to seek attention or excessive validation because you already know the answers. Um, and also reading the room. You know, this is, this is the tricky part of life in general is learning to read the room and throttle yourself meaning that being respectful of other people's time of course also being aware of your own motivations and also impression management so um on one hand if you're if you fear that you're going to be seen as the quiet one in the classroom, then you might have to go against the grain and ask a few questions to break the ice. But at the same time, you don't want to you don't want to overuse that strategy because that could shift the impression the opposite direction. Um, so really, it has to do a lot with motivate like what your motivation is. Um, and uh, you know, I can tell you that it doesn't matter what people think, but to, in some circumstances, it does. You know, and because that has a direct impact on how you're perceived. Absolutely. And if something is perceived to be real, it can sometimes be real in its consequences. You can get on somebody's bad side. Yeah, real quick, if, you, if you're not careful, but you can also get back on their good side. And so that's, that's the thing about impression is checking in with yourself and reading the room enough to know that if you are overdoing it, right, with the questions. And if, you know, being a little more savvy about it, like if you have a real need for additional questions and feedback, taking the time to write those things down and then approaching the teacher or that person or that boss at a more appropriate time. So that you're not, you're not rejecting yourself and you're not with, you're not completely containing, you're just being more savvy about how you go about it. Right. Does that help? Yeah. Oh, and yes, um, Aubrey, the, the idea of, imp of impression management actually comes from Goffman. He's a sociologist. He had a, something called stage theory. So it might be a good read if you want to Google that stage theory, Goffman. It's interesting. Um, and when it comes to like trying to identify with your students, um, it could be a little bit tricky since a lot of it happens like underneath the surface, but um, usually it's an issue with deadlines. So if deadlines continue to be a problem, even though um, time management related interventions are taking place, it's probably because it's resulting from some of these other fears that need to be understood and addressed. And um, also really high levels of anxiety when it comes to academic performance. So um, we'll talk about that with some like classroom strategies a little bit further down in today's webinar. But um, really um, another point of in intervention from the professor's point of view is to really try to create a classroom environment that makes it a lot more safe to fail, that doesn't stack really high risk assignments. So you have a lot of scaffolding points of formative feedback along the way so that all your grade is not dependent upon one performance that leads a lot of room for perfectionism to ensue. And then um, being really creative about many interventions that you can do to try to relieve your students' anxiety. Because one of the things that should be noted about this, uh, about this imposter cycle is this doesn't mean that students are unable to turn in their assignments or they're unable to succeed. They do. And as we see that uh, some people with 
that struggle with the uh, imposter phenomenon are high achieving. It just comes at its cost, a cost to a lot of psychological distress. And so when we're trying to improve well-being in higher education, which has become very much more of a focus since, um, you know, since our new norm has taken place, um, uh, this is, you know, some ways we can achieve that. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about your question on um, to speak from the instructor's point of view as well as the student's point of view? You mean if an instructor is is struggling with this or you mean in terms of working with students that might be struggling with this? Well, um, I was actually asking if there are signals that as instructors we should look for um, that might indicate um, and we may be oblivious that the student is, is struggling with this syndrome. And um, that's why I asked the question, is this, you know, are there signals? Like, is it the student, the student who has too many inane questions? Um, and how do we go about um, structuring our class so that it's comfortable for these students who have this syndrome. And it sounds like it's just connected to their personality. And many times when you're new with students, it's very hard to make the determination if they have some of these underlying uh, problems that we could help them with. And so I'm hearing it from a person's perspective as to what it feels like. But as an instructor, I was wondering if there are certain cues we can look for in order to incorporate our classroom and our classroom instruction to, to accommodate and help these students rather than fill them with anxiety. Yeah, um, let me just jump to some of those strategies then to answer your question. And then um, I'll have Patrick talk a little bit more about impression management. Thank you. Um, there's been different uh, definitions proposed and um, characteristics to some agreement and disagreement, um, but I do like this term a little bit better, perceived fraudulence that gets away from thinking about it as a personality disorder, a psychological disorder or having it being confused with real imposter syndrome. So you might hear me use this term perceived fraudulence a little bit. And um, that's really the idea behind it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so um, when it comes to like interventions in the classroom, um, if you look at Fink's taxonomy here, um, we have the typical like learning outcomes you might see in the green. And then you have these other dimensions of learning outcomes in the blue. So teaching people how to learn, how they learn, how it works best for them. And we also have these dimensions of caring and the human dimension. So really looking for opportunities in your class to go beyond just the understanding of the subject material at hand or the profession related competencies to um, providing opportunities for people to sort out their own feelings, interests and values. And one way you can do this is having opportunities for reflection. So um, that might be with uh, portfolio keeping or um, thinking about yourself in the future or connecting perhaps the assignments with your own values and reflexive thinking, um, thinking about your influence on other people and how you see yourself in society, making your own unique contributions, learning about oneself and others. So in essence, it's bringing a human dimension into the classroom so that we can balance rewards with things that human beings actually value so that everything is not so stacked on the importance of the task itself. Because we know that imposter, um, uh, false, <laughs> fake imposters, it's triggered you know, with that achievement related task, right? 
So if we can really take the air out of that task, like take the importance away from the task and focus a little bit more on um, things we actually care about as human beings, then I think some of that anxiety can be alleviated. Another one is to um, have opportunities in your classroom for people to talk about themselves in a way that's comfortable and um, talk about struggles that we have. It might even be you as the professor, like um, in maybe small and professional ways, revealing your own flaws so that um, you can get rid of this sort of iceberg type scenario because uh, another thing that happens with uh, false imposters is this idea that, you know, everybody else is having a much easier time than I am. Because when we look at how it, our, the other students in the classroom are performing, they seem to be having a much easier time. They don't struggle as much as I do. And um, it's not true, right? We all struggle a lot behind the scenes in our own ways. We're just not forthright about that because we have a competitive environment that teaches us to appear to be more perfect than we actually are, to show up polished, right? So um, taking opportunities to emphasize that would really help. And um, let me just check my notes real quick, make sure I'm not forgetting anything on this point. Yeah, I think I said it. Okay, good. And um, the other part is creating a safe to fail environment, right? Safe to fail is better than foolproof. So um, how can you create a more safe to fail environment? Well, um, failure is like actually an important part of learning. And how did you say it, Patrick? Like failure is the beginning. Oh. First attempt in learning. <laughs> Failure is the first attempt in learning. Yeah. So it's really a necessary piece to learning, right? But for the fake imposter, you know, learning is such a point or failure is such a point of anxiety. It's something that to be avoided at all costs. So you want to break that mindset. And some ways that you can do that is um, using that formative process with drafts and feedback before submitting a final piece of work. So um, uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that if you have a final paper due at the end of class, like don't just set that, <laughs> have that paper stand by itself and then wait until the end of the class to have it due. And then, you know, the failures, like then it's like very high stakes, right? If you get a bad grade on that paper, you're gonna do very poorly in the class. So that's setting things up to be very not safe to fail. Better is to break that up into smaller pieces, have those pieces turned in, and multiple opportunities for the instructor to provide feedback on that performance, and even better opportunities for peers to provide feedback on that importance. The more, the bigger the audience, the more people that are seeing it, the more meaning it's going to take on, and the more you can build a uh, community in your classroom rather than, you know, have learning as a shared experience rather than a very individualistic sort of thing. Um, move away from really high stakes tasks like timed exams, et cetera. You know, try to think about the value that we're trying to bring into the real world. What is the future of the workplace and what we're training people to do and what skills are actually gonna be valuable there. So we don't want to stress people out just for the sake of doing it, right? We want to have people to be stretched and challenged and so what that means is we want good stress, use stress to come from the challenge of doing the task, but not stress in the term of distress, like where we provide opportunities for these fears and rumination to build. Um, you know, providing some choice. So with multi-modalities and literacies, um, I guess the multi-literacies is more to a, the future of the workplace in the university kind of thing. But in terms of, you know, breaking the imposter cycle, I would say that just providing some of that choice in combination with those human dimensions to help people carve their path to learning in a way that's meaningful to them so that they get out of this cycle of trying to please other people, doing what they think the, what the instructor to do or what other people will value 
and getting to know themselves very well. And uh, also um, get rid of the uncertainty, right? The more uncertainty, the worse. So be very, very transparent. You know, if you want a certain something from your students, you know, we see this a lot with when it comes to like online discussions and some and stuff like that. We we expect people to know what we want, but then we don't say it when we write the assignment instructions. So say exactly what you want, have very clear, easy to follow rubrics, and just take all the uncertainty out of it. Um, look for opportunities to check perfectionism. So um, this means having like early interventions, um, many interventions, I would get, I would call it. Um, and this is a point to where uh, you, as the professor, you have to be very creative in how you do this, depending on the kind of class you have. If it's a big class with 300 people, you might have to break things into smaller groups and look for ways to do it. If you have a smaller class, you might have more opportunities for um, individual attention, um, even like check-ins with projects between you and the student can help. Uh, I tell you in PFF, we're doing a model to where um, we have, um, we have we, we're lucky to have a team. So, you know, we're able to have some of our team members meet individually with each student every week. And that's a game changer because you can get to know somebody on a personal level, understand the things that are going on with their lives and spot these points and blockages and, and work with that student to remove those blockages early on so that they have the best chance of being successful. And so um, I would love to hear about any strategies you might be able to come up with for these many interventions, but uh, we can all think of different challenges with the kinds of classes we're teaching that might make this difficult, but I would challenge us to not think about what makes it difficult but to use these uh, wonderful brains that we all have and think of creative ways, new interventions, new ways we can transform the way education is done to have more of these um, personal moments with our students and to check some of these blockages that people have. So we can set them up for the best chances of success, not just in our class, not just for the subject material, but for, throughout their academic career and in life. Um, setting clear, or, okay, so um, consider writing like course expectations and not just course policies. So course policies are something like, you know, rules that we set, like no eating in the classroom, no using technology. You know, we see like rules like that for our course policies. Um, you know, no, no, nothing turned in past a certain point or you lose points, but write course expectations because in your syllabus, you can really, you write whatever you want, right? You can set your own expectations. So um, you might say something in your syllabus and just change that mindset, you know, change the way the course feels. Learning in this course is a shared responsibility. Cooperation is highly valued, so please help each other. Um, Avoid comparing yourself to your classmates. We only see what's on the surface, but understand that we all struggle in our own way. Um, uh, perfectionism is discouraged. Please make a realistic evaluation of how much time others are spending reviewing your work compared to the amount of time and effort that you spend preparing your work. A good professional practice is to start with the least effort and expand where needed. Please evaluate your performance in this course based on what happens inside this course and not what has happened in the past. In this course, I want you to stretch yourself. So please leave any preconceived notions you have about your abilities that would make it more difficult at the door. Um, I mean, I won't go through every one of them. Um, this is an important one. If you're struggling, please talk about it or ask for help. Talk to me or access the campus resources listed in the syllabus, such as disability services, counseling services, et cetera. So actually write these sort of things in your syllabus to let your learners know what your expectations are for the course in terms of their well-being and health and how that relates to learning. Because I strongly believe 
well-being and academic rigor, academic achievement are not separate things. They're one and the same. The better your health is, the more you're going to be able to learn and take those healthy risks that are so important to develop as a human being. Um, I want to have time for this. Um, yeah, why address this in higher education, early intervention, break the cycle, model human-centered leadership for people who go into society. Obviously, the imposter cycle can lead to burnout and dropout, loss of research talent, so we want to prevent that. And um, college management, we want people to choose the right majors and careers, especially when teaching undergraduate. All right, I want to go back to Patrick. Where's this slide? Oh, it's okay. I need a slide, but there you go. Um, that was <laughs> yes. fantastic. Yeah, I Let's think talk really about more point. about that yeah. impression management. Yeah. Really, really well said about creating a supportive environment where people feel comfortable um, supporting each other, right? And that that ties right into impression management. So this this notion that everybody is worried what other people think about them on some level or have an idea of what other people think about them. And so what we're trying to do is mitigate the need where people are more comfortable dropping their guard once they have that all in the same boat mentality um, to help them actually address their fears or dispel their fears. Because, you know, every student in the classroom, they have a goal. There's a reason they're there. There's a reason they want what they want and that, you know, why they're studying what they're studying. And I think it's easy to forget that people even though they want something, they forget necessarily why they want it. I guess we get so caught up in all of the, the fears between us and what we want that it can prevent us from showing up as our best, our best selves, best students. Um, and so as professors, if you can think, like Jonathan just said, ways to help demystify the process for them, that's you know a big one. Um, find a way to check in with them regularly, whether it's during lecture, office hours, via email, finding ways to give a platform to check in, ask questions, vent. I remember when I was in graduate school, we had to uh, do something called process recordings. And that was mandated. And basically what that was, it was literally processing our experience and the work we were doing, whether it was our field work, internships, the classroom. Uh, also, he had mentioned portfolio. We kept portfolios about our classwork. Um, and we had a lot of collaboration projects. And so all of those things helped to facilitate breathing room to process what we were experiencing emotionally, not just checking the box. And to allow a learning environment that had room for mistakes, you know, and to learn to fail fast. You know, I love that diagram that was up there about um, fail safe environments, but it's also important to make room for people to learn to fail fast. I mean, if the, the quicker we get out of our head with a failure, the quicker we, we rebound and correct course. And so I think being a, as a professor, being approachable will, will really help with you know, those who are struggling with anxiety and perception and impression management, if they know that the professor is approachable, their peers are approachable, um, it'll foster that camaraderie. That's really the, in my opinion, the best type of learning environment. Not that everybody gets a medal, you know, not that everybody gets a, a free pass, but rather that we can support each other, you know, in our, in our learning process. So we, and it'll make a better use of everybody's time and the, the experience in graduate school in general, because that translates to the workforce, you know, and it translates to what they're going to be doing career-wise after and how to manage stress, you know, so whatever you can do as a professor to help them understand that their experience in school, those skills translate to the workforce, not just the knowledge, but stress management, time management, transparency, camaraderie, 
all of those things um, will help correct whatever maladaptive perceptions they had going in. Because one thing we know about imposter syndrome is its origins. You know, the, the narratives we learn growing up in the home, whether that was on, on the one side of the spectrum, the very rigid high expectation household where the only validation you received was when you did a perfect job or the very unorthodox background um, where there was no expectations and we, you know, you had to be resilient, the resilient one and find your way through it. Um, it's very polarized. So if there is that type of narrative, you know, that the students taking with them into graduate school, this is their chance to have a corrective experience with their professor where there's a balance when it's like, it's okay to make mistakes, but we also teach them how to fail fast and learn from them. But the only way that that's gonna be identified and you were asking um, Linda about how do we know if a client is struggling with imposter syndrome? The problem is we don't because a big part of that is the, they've mastered impression management. They've mastered the art of doing what they need to do to get praised, but then, you know, being quiet oftentimes the rest of the time, not taking what we consider socially acceptable risks. Now, this is different than what we see in like the, you know, narcissists or perfectionists, you know, they tend to be very good at not being transparent. And this is the interesting thing about people with imposter syndrome is they are generally more transparent about their handicaps, but not to the people in authority to their peers. And this is why it's really important to foster that camaraderie among the classmates, because they'll be transparent with each other more than they'll be transparent with the teacher because of that strong desire for validation. And so learning to validate, but also check in. And in, in your lecturing, just being very repetitive about asking questions and that failure is part of learning and it's it's okay to not necessarily know or to get stuck and if you feel stuck or you don't something isn't registering to talk about it maybe reserve some time after the lecture or have many check-ins during lecture you know every 30 minutes just taking a, taking five minutes every 30 minutes and saying and you know so we just covered x y and z any thoughts you know ask open-ended questions you know prompt discussion for just a few minutes and then you can resume the lecture. Just finding ways for, en for engagement, I think is the most important way to combat that impression management because it'll get them outside of their head if you can get them talking. Does that make sense? Yeah, and we know this because we all experience this, you know, the more, the more we're allowed to kind of dwell in our head, the deeper into our insecurities we go, right? <laughs> But if we get to talking openly about our thoughts and how we're feeling about class or the subject, or even, even the speaking of what we feel confident about in public reinforces our esteem to perform. So it's, it's kind of a win-win if we can, not that you can't have the whole lecture, obviously being chit chat, you know, but if it's constructive, you know, bite sizes of um, feedback, I, I think that would be a huge win you know, for the classroom. Yeah. Um, and to Patrick's point, you know, um, you may not know, but that's where universal design and learning comes in. Um, design your class in a way that helps to meet the needs of all students, not those that have uh, traditionally made up the environment of higher education and uh, let's be and a greater importance of that is non-traditional students now make up the majority of our college students and we're really opening things up to more and more people which makes it even more and more important that we uh, that we deploy universal design and learning and even by being here today i know that all of you are very proactive about that <laughs> so that's great. Um, at the university level, you know, we can also, um, when it comes to college success workshops and committees and stuff like that, that we're serving in, um, time management is great. That's needed. But, you know, 
opportunities for impression management and talking about imposter syndrome are important too. And uh, let's move our prestige in university away from just being about academic rigor and also to being about how healthy and happy our students are. Um, so I shared some links. Um, you have Patrick's information. And um, I wanna hear, open to have more opportunity for discussion, but um, we are running out of time. So let me just launch this poll real quick because this will help us to know how helpful this webinar was to you. If you enjoyed it, if you didn't, what sorts of things you would like to see us do in the future, we would really appreciate it. If you can just take a moment. Let me do the final plugs. Uh, our upcoming webinars, we have one on integrating open education resources. So this is going to be by Jennifer Beamer. She's a, um, a, a publishing specialist here at the university. She works at the library and she's very informative. Um, she's done some professional development stuff with us in the past and can tell you a lot about open publishing. Uh, Shamini Diaz, the director, will be co-hosting that. So highly encourage you to attend. It will be a great one for your own professional development. And we also have uh, Shamini, director of the Preparing Future Faculty Program, uh, teaching in non-classroom spaces. So we have a lot of students at this university who are not going in traditional classroom teaching roles, but are doing things like health education, um, organizational behavior, and these other kinds of um, leadership positions where design thinking, system thinking is still very important. And a lot of what we teach in PFF is very applicable. So I highly encourage you to attend that. Please join us on LinkedIn. Uh, it's called Ethical Pedagogy Community. Uh, we're growing very fast. This screenshot says 100 members. We're up to 200 members now. And um, the link is in the chat. I'll go ahead and post the links there again. There we go. And um, that this is a great community because we have a lot of alumni that have gone on and are working at universities all over the country. And so they post opportunities and um, it's great to engage and help each other in our journeys. Well, there you have it, another tool to help you thrive. If you're getting value from this content and you haven't done so already, be sure to like and subscribe and share with someone else so you can continue to help raise mental health awareness. Now go make good things happen. Bye-bye.